Welcome more gamers to day four of Legions of Nagash weekend. Today we're taking a look at the Mortark of Night, Manfred von Karstein. We're going to start by taking a look at his old world lore, giving a very condensed and kind of brief synopsis of it and what brought him into the Age of Sigmar and what he is up to right now. As with all the characters that come from the old world, because I never know, you know, if people this is their first video, I always preface by saying that uh, old world lore, the Warmer Fantasy Battle books, are not necessarily obsolete or wrong anymore, but they have been kind of relegated to this place of being a mythical type legend. Uh, no way to know if they're true or not, but I say them to you to give you a good feel for the character. As Manfred is in several, several books, I'm going to head a very, very condensed form of his history. Uh, just to get you an idea what the character is like. Now up to this point, most of the vampire lore that we have covered in this series focuses on like really ancient times, like the Nehekarin, which is the Tomb Kings type level stuff. Um, the fates of Nagash and Arkan and Neferata were all very closely intertwined. It was actually very hard to tell their stories separately because they're so kind of convoluted with one another. But Manfred kind of has his own story, which is really, really great for kind of explaining it to people. Uh, it does kind of start, I guess, sort of after Neferata, who first, uh, she was the first vampire and introduced that into the world. But after her story ends, uh, Soul Blight and it kind of spread all across the old world. And aesthetically, it evolved as well, not just from the kind of Tomb Kings, Egyptian type aesthetic, but also to the very uh, Transylvania Bram Stoker type Dracula that we know in the real world. Right, several of those houses that were in uh, Nehekar kind of migrated and evolved and changed over time, and they settled in a portion of the old world called Sylvania, which of course is a, a kind of play on Transylvania, the home of uh, Dracula in our real world fantasies. And at one point in time, uh, one of the ruling families in kind of this vampire aristocracy area were the Von Karsteins. It's a family name, really, and it was led by Vlad Von Karstein. Vlad is a fan favorite for some of this older fiction. And I'll be going over some great books that include Manfred and Vlad. They have a great relationship. By that I mean they're constantly trying to outdo slash outwit and kill each other, but it's really a great story. Anyway, Vlad is the leader of this household, and uh, he had his first sire, meaning he made someone a soul blight, and that was, of course, Manfred von Karstein. And Manfred was known for a few things, one being incredibly cunning and egotistical, but also for being very gifted when it came to magic. Uh, all of the soul blights in the old world and in Age of Sigmar are magically gifted in some facet, uh, to, so to stand out above that means you actually have a really true talent. Now there are several books that are detailed in the Vampire Wars series, uh, also known as the Var Von Karstein Trilogy by Stephen Seville. Uh, they're great books, you should absolutely read them, but to kind of condense them, they really center around Manfred and his uh, stealing of power from those around him, right, his contemporaries. He wants to be the absolute best. In fact, all vampires in Soul Blight want to be the absolute best. This book series isn't necessarily about him specifically, he's one of a cast of characters, but they're all kind of that same vicious backstabbing and it's a great great series and so i'm going to kind of rapid fire through the kind of the high points of those stories again if you are a dedicated fan to the old world lore you're going to see a lot of holes here uh we're making broad strokes here to introduce new folks to manfred von karstein so uh to put it shortly he betrayed his master vlad he traveled to lamia and learned ancient secrets of necromancy right he kind of gained hidden ancient knowledge that kind of set him above the other vampires around him. Stole several works of Nagash, trying to uh, kind of harness their power, kind of discern new ways of doing death magic. He tried to invade the Empire of Man, and he wanted to basically subjugate all of humanity. His idea being if you had a whole army of thralls and subjects, they would wage war, and, and basically, kind of like Nagash is thinking now, right, if you take over everything that's living, then you can have the now everything undead stuff fight chaos and fight the lizard people and fight you know what i mean like you make an army out of the living and that was basically manfred's story as well he wanted to take over the empire men and then now he can consolidate those forces and take on chaos or dark elves or what you know whatever the other old world factions were that were threatening him well as you can imagine that plan failed he was killed he's been resurrected as a lot of the old world characters especially death themed ones are and he reestablished his power base. Uh, when he was resurrected, he went back to the von Karstein's family, struck down whoever was in charge now, and reasserted himself as leadership. 
The books kind of take a pause there. We meet Manfred again in the end times. He assisted Arkan the Black in bringing back Nagash for a very specific purpose. It might seem altruistic for someone like Manfred to help bring back someone who's kind of God. Uh, but his point was he wanted to somehow mess up or corrupt the process of it so that he could exert control over Nagash, thinking that if he had Nagash in his pocket, he would be absolutely unstoppable. Now we know, obviously, that that did not happen, and after he was reborn, Nagash peered inside Manfred's mind and kind of instantly knew what he was planning, and, and really put him on a short, short leash. Which, of course, was the greatest insult to Manfred ever. But for a majority of the end times, he was very happy to... Well, I say very happy, he followed orders from Nagash, very unhappily, actually, but he was a loyal enough servant for Nagash's needs. Until the very end, when Manfred was looking and uh, seeing the kind of very near destruction of the old world was about to be at, he thought maybe if these Order guys fight off chaos and win, they would assert themselves in total control, and he can't have that. And so in a last minute, right before the end times ended and concluded, he actually uh, betrayed everyone and led chaos to them. And so it was just a big mess. Really, he just betrayed all the good guys at once, thinking that chaos would kill the Order faction, and he would be able to kill the chaos and usurp control. The point is, always looking for a way to dominate every situation, exert absolute authority, and backstab anyone he needs to to achieve it. And that moment of betrayal is the last thing we see of Manfred in the old world. And then Age of Sigmar begins, and we kind of lose his trail for a little bit and pick it right back up. We actually meet Manfred again for the first time in Age of Sigmar in an audio drama called Prisoner of Black Sun. Stormcast Eternals are seeking an audience with Nagash, uh, and as they're kind of trying to find a way to find him, they find this prison with a very sickly looking soul blight inside of it. Uh, he doesn't really reveal himself for quite some time, leading them astray until he has the perfect position to backstab them, uh, get them trapped and killed, and uh, reveals himself to be Manfred von Karstein. Now this begins a uh, a very well received audio drama series where Stormcast Eternals are hunting Manfred and is still kind of seeking an audience with Nagash, but it becomes very clear very quickly he is not interested in talking to them. I personally have not finished that entire audio drama series. I tend to not like audio dramas as much as I do actual books where I can go back and recite things, get quotes and that kind of thing, but they are very well received. So if you're into it, please go check them out. The Allegiance of Nagash book really catches us up on what he's been up to, uh, a few new facts that we learned about him, about kind of the way he operates in the realm of death. We know that he is constantly armed to the teeth, okay? It recounts the artifacts that he uses, which you can see on his war scroll. He wears the armor of Tempelhof, uh, which is supposed to be like forged in the depths of fiery hell and all those things. You know, all this stuff has very dramatic backstories, but he has the armor of Tempelhof. He has Geistvor, which is a sword that drinks the souls of its victims, and he rides upon his dread abyssal, Ashigaroth. Which it seems like everyone got a free, you know, ride when they became Mortark. Much like Neferata, who carved out a piece of the Realm of Death for herself, uh, Manfred did much of the same. He has a section of Shaiish called Karstinia, and this is modeled after the old world Sylvania. High, sharp mountains, lots of forest and wooded area, tends to be dark there a lot. Kind of that very stereotypical vampire type thing that we know from, you know, older real world fiction. This world is full of mindless people and undead servants. The servants are actually made to look like his former rivals, that way it seems as though they are serving him now. But despite having his own little slice of heaven, uh, he's very unsatisfied with staying there. For some reason it seems to remind him of all the failures that he had in the old world. Which makes sense if you build a place that's built on memories, uh, you're kind of trapped by them as much as you are finding comfort in them. And because of that, he tends to be out of his land, going out and campaigning a lot, right? Waging wars on all fronts. His savagery, his carelessness, I mean, all those things, they really play into making him a, a, a great champion for Nagash to send out into an area to conquer in his name. We talked about the other day about Arkan is really great for building kingdoms because he manages all the labor, and Neferata's skill is really in managing them and, and all the different personalities that are involved in those. Uh, but Manfred von Karstein is really fantastic at conquering. He loves, he has like bloodlust. He loves to see his enemies driven out before him to feel that sense of dominance over somebody else. That predatory nature is really a useful tool for Nagash. And for now, Manfred is okay with the idea of serving Nagash, as all the Immortarchs have to do. 
Uh, but of course, he's always in secret looking for a way to usurp that power. He wants to be the undisputed king of death. And really, that's the lore that we have brought up on Manfred. But I want to transition into a bigger section on why is he such a captivating character. There are a lot of great things about Manfred. The first one is his non-traditional warfare. I didn't go into detail into it before, but I'm going to right now. See, where most armies, you line up your champions and your best warriors, and you kind of go head on and clash each other. Manfred does not fight like that. Instead of kind of going for your capital ship or your leader or your general, he's going to pick the weakest part of your entire kingdom and he's going to hit that. While you bring all of your best troops onto the battlefield, Manfred will send some thrall, right? Maybe a white king or something out there to fight your general. And then he's going to lead a force behind your lines and he's going to kill all your women and children, destroy everything that you're fighting for. It's underhanded, it's sneaky, and it's ruthless. Because he's a rather petty person. He would rather kill you know, a thousand souls that are just far beneath him in terms of strength and power level than one champion who can, like, match him blow for blow. There, he doesn't see the honor in fighting someone who's as good as you. He relishes in the destruction of fighting those who are weaker. He's a man who despises a fair fight, and he uses tools like fear and darkness as weapons of war just as much as he uses his spells and his swords. And this is why I think the Mortark of Night is a fitting thing, right? When he comes, darkness comes. Nobody is safe when Manfred comes into your area. There's no sense of honor or justice or there's no non-combatants, anything like that. Uh, no, everything's up for games. Everyone has to be ready to fight because he's going to come after the weakest of you. And this ruthlessness and this savagery makes him a very, very strong tool for Nagash to use. Remember, Nagash doesn't really like any of these people. It's not a matter of liking them or finding favor with his servants like you see with the other Chaos Gods who pour out blessings or Sigmar who has favored warriors. Nothing like that. To Nagash, everyone is a tool to be used, whether willing or unwilling. So when we think about how someone as backstabbing and disloyal as Manfred fits into a Nagash army, it's because Nagash views him as a tool and in many cases this kind of tool is very useful as long as you keep it on a short leash. Nagash is intelligent enough to know that he's always trying to backstab him and those kinds of things and so he makes precautions for that. But at the end of the day Manfred does really good work when it comes to destroying armies and conquering kingdoms and so that makes him an asset. And because of those things he stands out as a terrifying hero that is also pretty clearly a very petty person. The idea of making your undead servants look like your former enemies, it's a very petty thing, right? It, it, you, there's nothing there but a sense of self-satisfaction. It's because his ego needs to be stroked. He needs to be reminded of the people that he's conquered or at least outlived. The idea of failure and reminding him of that is so powerful in him. Like that, that guilt and that shame is something he blocks out so heavily that he doesn't even really go home that much anymore to this place that he created. He strikes at the weakest and most undefended part of the enemy. I mean, these are not heroic qualities, despite the fact that he is a hero of a death army. This makes him fascinating because at the same time he is an anti-hero and a villain, right? You want to see Manfred's schemes, but you also want them to fail. When he's in a story, it's unique because you root for the good guy and the bad guy at the same time, which makes for great storytelling. It's really fun to see the kind of trouble he can get into because of his ego and his pride and all these various things where he thinks he's so great. He always thinks he has the best plan and the best way to achieve his goals, but then you just see it all crumble. Why? Because he's not the undisputed king of death, Nagash is, and as much as he tries, he, he can't beat him. And folks, those are my thoughts on Manfred von Karstein, Mortark of Night. And if you have an Age of Sigmar lore question, I would love to answer it. Go ahead and click subscribe and leave it in the comments down below. I'm dedicating this week to Legions of Nagash, but I'll be getting back to your questions here very, very shortly. If you want to support the channel, go ahead and share this video, whether in a Facebook group, with friends, anywhere you want. Uh, it goes a long way and really means a lot to me. And if you'd like to support me in a more personal way, head over to the 2 Plus Tough store down in the show notes and check out my line of gaming mats set in the Realm of Death. They are perfect for the Malign Portents campaign going on right now. And they are relatively cheap, actually, uh, compared to the competition. And once they're gone, they're gone for good. I'm not making any more of them. And if you don't have the money for that, I completely understand. And I just want to say thank you so much for watching this video here with me today. And I look forward to seeing you in my next Age of Sigmar lore video. Thank you so much for watching, and happy wargaming.